Now, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk recently about economic recovery. My next guest also believes we need to talk about a mental recovery. Uh, here to tell us how to live a life of joy, please welcome psychiatrist Professor Jim Lucy. Jim, I suppose we kind of often wonder these days if the country is in some kind of state of post-traumatic stress disorder and we're, we're working through it. Anger being our current stage, judging by the elections. Now, where do you think we're at? I think there's no doubt we've been through a great trauma, a national trauma. And to deny the effect on our well-being, on our mental state, is, uh, is, is really impossible. It's obvious that we're so uh, distressed. We've suffered a lot. Uh, and our uh, physical health and our mental health are not divided. You know, our, mm -hmm. our, our well-being is our mental health. The phrase we use all the time, Brendan, is there is no health without mental health. Yeah. And in a culture such as ours, that well-being has taken a major hit and people have suffered. So yes, their anger, I suppose, through the stages of grief, really, rather than trauma, we're mm -hmm. going to have to get to a point of acceptance and perhaps a realisation of what we can do um, to, 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 to turn this around. And I know you think part of it as well is that... Uh, in a sense, that society has become more atomized and that people are more isolated now and that that doesn't help. Well, I think there's either. no doubt that, I mean, the, if you like, the economics of the 80s and 90s that led up to this recent crash, you know, announced that there was no such thing as society in the first place. That was Mrs. T's great phrase. There is only uh, men and women and there's only shopping. Uh, yeah. So, you know, culture ended and society ended. And uh, individualization, that was a big policy of ours. Now, I'm no politician, Brenton, uh -huh. but I am uh, aware that we're social beings. And as a psychiatrist, I know how important it is for us to be uh, connected to each other. So we've got a society now that is more disconnected, uh, more atomized, as I say, more commuted. Yeah. And so we've got a, a, long, a longer commute to, to well-being. Okay, I like a commute to well-being. Now, this is, this is your book, is In My Room, and this is, it's essentially about 15 case studies with, with various people who came to see you in, in your practice. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think it shines a lot of lights into little areas of the Irish psyche. I was intrigued by one thing you say in it, which is, I think you're talking about suicide, and you say that the, the issues there are depression, alcohol abuse, and then something you call the Irish factor. Yes. What's the Irish factor? Well, that's the puzzle, isn't it? This is a line from uh, Professor Kevin Malone, at UCD, who's done really the, the best studies on uh, the suicide crisis in this country, which, you know, we, we are losing between one and two people every day through suicide. Mm -hmm. F at the end of a month, 50 people lost. It's a huge pr problem. It's the biggest unmet need in our country at this moment. It wasn't much of an issue in this election. And yet it is a huge issue for the families that pay the terrible pain and loss of this grief. And we don't know what that third factor is. We do know that unemployment has a huge bearing. We know that uh, alcohol abuse is a huge bearing. And we know that there is a, a climate of distress uh, that comes in societies uh, and ebbs and flows. And we've gone through that climate of distress. I suppose that's the Ireland factor we're talking about. What makes that up? Well, it's to do with the losses, to do with the uh, migration, to do with the uh, huge disappointment we have and the sense that we you know, had hopes for a nation and we have to rebuild them and replace those hopes with, with recovery. And that's really what the book is about. I was asked, you know, would I write a book as a so-called expert? And I said, well, I can't because the real experts are the experts by experience, the people who've been through this. And why don't, I, I, there wasn't anybody else out giving those people a voice. Mm. So it was a privilege really to listen to their, their voice and, and, and capture them in a way which uh, I think every, every person in, in, in the room could, could recognise I, I think everybody will get something out of, out of all of those. There'll be people they know and families. And yes, all that I mean, I stuff. wanted yeah. it not to, I think it, we were talking about the way forward for recovery. I mean, surely the people who've been there, they've mm -hmm. been to the wall, they've, they've know, they, know, they know what it's been like and hopefully have got through it rather than around it or back from it. They yeah. can help us more. There's a few, a few, I want to ask you about some things that, that come up in the course of the case. One thing that you touch on is that we like to think now that 
oh, there's no stigma about mental health anymore and we're all talking about our depression and all that kind of thing, but it, it, you do think that there's still a fair amount of stigma around it all? Yeah, I think there's enormous stigma. I think we have a huge problem with shame and guilt in the country, but stigma, I mean, what, what we mean by stigma, Brendan, is that mark which actually uh, cuts you off from the piece of the prospect of good health. I mean, after all, mental health is good health. Yeah. And while we have greater awareness now, and there's huge progress been made in the media and here and RT and other people have done great work in bringing together the opportunity for celebrities to speak up, and we could really have to be positive about that because leadership is great. We still have uh, some way to go in changing the country so that we actually make it possible for people to access the conversation. The key thing here is that we know that half of the d delay in getting help is the delay in opening up the conversation. Okay. And we still don't open the... I, I compare because to... I suppose if you go into... If you're not a celebrity and you go into an ordinary job yeah. and you say to them, uh, actually, I'm mentally ill at the yeah. moment, I won't yeah. be in for a while. Well, that, I mean, forget... A huge the job is a great example, but even think about it. You know, if you go for a pint with somebody and say, you know, mine's a pint, by the way, I've been depressed for the last three months, it's, it's not going to... The evening's not going to rock. We don't think it's right to do this. Whereas we need to start the conversation and actually open it up. And we know that half the delay in getting up... Now, these are huge delays. If your car broke down today, if my car broke down today, chances are I could get help within an hour. But if I have a mental breakdown today, the chances are I won't get any help for 18 months. Really? Because yeah. I won't have spoken about it for nine oh, months. Okay, okay. And the yeah. truth is we need to do something about that. Yeah. You do, you, a lot of the, the kind of weirdness we have around this area, you, you do say it's kind of, it's to do with our history and our folk memory and stuff yeah. like that. That yeah. I suppose, like before, when somebody was, had the nerves or whatever, a lot of the time, like, they took to the bed or were locked yeah. away, and there yeah. was this sense that they were away, they were other, and they never came back, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, and, and there's a lot's been written about that, but it, 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 let's be clear about the figures. I mean, I, I, I put this in very personal terms. So I was born in 1959, okay? Right. Um, that's the date. That year, 2% of Ireland's population were locked in asylums, wow. permanently, locked by order. They couldn't get out. It was the, they, were, they were confined to them. Now, that was the highest the Western world had ever seen. If no democracy in the Western world and post-war society had ever reached anything like that. Now, we have dismantled that, and it's a great thing, but it's a huge memory for us, and we really don't believe that mental health treatment works. We don't really believe the right. conversation is going to work. We don't know people get better every day. People say to me, they say to me, Brendan, how do you cope with your job? And the reality is they think, it must be so sad. It must be so depressing. Yeah. Well, actually, I see people getting better every day. It's a privilege to witness that, and I witness that every day. Because you, you do try and push the notion that, like, it seemed to me that a lot of those people were, you know, there's this notion that well, some of us are sane, you and me are sane, mm. and there's crazy people out there or whatever. Well, but we a lot can of be the sure about you, Brendan, you, but, you know, who yeah. knows? I mean, okay. let's take, take stigma as far as it but, goes. But <laughs> a lot of the people who come into you are... They're regular people, and it's a lot of the time they've just suffered a loss in their life, maybe, yeah. or they're not coping, yeah. or stress, right. or whatever, yeah? All of the people I see are the regular people. Yeah. Because everybody who becomes mentally ill is a regular person. Every family in the land has somebody in mental distress now. Everybody in this audience has somebody in mental distress right now. Everybody at home watching has somebody, and they're all regular people. I purposely wanted to include people who, you know, worked in a factory, a man who works as a barber, somebody who works in a, as a computer man, a woman, a woman who works as a librarian. You know, these are regular people. There aren't us and then them who become mentally ill. Actually, all of us are, you know, we're Spartacus. We could all put our hand up yeah. and say, I've been there or I could be there. And one in four of us will be there. But the good news is that it's episodic, Brendan. But why Recovery are people, happens. And so why are people afraid then? To, if, if it's just like that's something that they're, they're going through, that's happening to them for a short mm. time and that mm. they can't get out there, mm. like, why the reluctance? Because, again, in the book, a lot of the guys particularly, mm. their, their wives or girlfriends had to send them that's there. Right. What are people afraid of, do you think? I think that they're afraid of that historic memory, the past that you remember, so, so you described so well, we, the idea that the uh, asylum is going to be the end, that there's going to be no recovery. I think the experience of mental health distress is very, very distressing. I mean, the pain people are going, there'll be people watching this tonight who are wondering, well, should I get help? 
you know, should I make that call? And the answer is, the earlier you do, the better. So people are frightened of this very great distress. And then they don't know that we're now in a modern era of effective treatment, effective talking treatments. So we were talking in the green room, Brendan, and you said, you're a psychiatrist, don't you just give tablets? Mm. So people don't yet know that psychiatrists don't just give tablets. We haven't really communicated that. And we've had all these wars about who does what. You know, are you a brain man and so are you mindless? Right, are you a psychology right. mind, so are you a brainless? And those, so the brainless and the mindless have been fighting with each other. And, and, and it's over. The people themselves know that recovery is their right. And luckily, there's enough people out there looking for that right to be vindicated. And part of all of that as well is when, when people do recover and they, and they go back out there into their lives, you think it's hugely important that there be connectivity out there in a society and that we be connected to each other and stuff. I think yeah. connectivity is hugely important. For, in fact, it's one of those things that defines wellness. And I think we need to probably speak probably less about illness, less about the tiger depression, less about the, what we've been through, and start thinking about the recovery phase. And I think that would be also matched on our, our, our well-being as a society. When we get recovery, we must get mental recovery as well. Mm -hmm. And that'll be about connecting us each other, getting back to cl our clubs, our families, our, our relationships, to sing and to dance. You know, that's, those are the things that actually... Really, is make, singing and dancing good, Singing yeah? and dancing is really good for you, Brendan. It turns yeah. out there's actually good scientific... You know, uh, people like me might like to look at scientific studies. Now there's yeah. good scientific studies showing that it's much better to be in a choir than it is not to be in a choir. Turns out it's not very good if you're a really good singer. But actually, if you're not a very good singer, it's great yeah, to be yeah. in a choir. Join in with some <laughs> Join others. Join in. And Listen, be, before you go, we did promise people that you would tell us a few secrets of a joyful life. You know, you do say in the book that we have trouble in this country imagining a sober life as a life with joy, that basically occasions of joy, we think about them as being drink fuel. So if we put the, put the drink aside. Put the drink aside. How, how else can we just, in it, Day-to-day -day life, how can we bring more joy into our lives? Well, could I start with sleep? It would okay. really be good to get some sleep. And it, you don't just catch, just catch up at the end of the week having missed out or catch up after four days. Try and get some regular sleep. The volume of it, probably better to get six hours, but actually regular sleep, hugely important. More than any other physical correlate of getting unwell, sleep, <coughs> loss of sleep is a big one. I suppose exercise, but really not... I, all right, it's fine to be on the treadmill. If you can stand the boredom of it, that's okay. But actually, it's great to be in a group exercising together. You know, so if you're doing the Zumba dancing or whatever, all the group, okay. that really works. And I think it's really important to try and eat well. I mean, if you can eat well, and ideally with friends, whatever you can do, that you connect with other people so that then you're not isolated. The big problem for people is that they feel alone, they feel down, and they feel they must be privately ashamed about that, and so they withdraw. So engage that person and say, come and eat with us, come and dance with us, come and sing with us. Let's build a recovery together. That's how actually you build mental wellness in family and in friends and in our clubs and in our, you know, when we play GAA, whatever we're doing, that's what actually will rebuild the wellness that's going to sustain us through these next challenging years because okay. it's not over yet. Do you see it happening, Jim, do you oh, think? I have no doubt that this, the, I, I'm tremendously encouraged by the young people. The young people's awareness, their tolerance of the marginalised, their tolerance of uh, and awareness of, of, of mental Ill, uh, issues is hugely greater than my generation was. I think there's a great deal of hope there. Brilliant. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Jim Lucy. Thank you very much. And Jim's book, In My Room, is out now.